everyone on the internet. Hi. I've never done this before. It's kind of strange being live streamed. <laughs> so yeah, I'm assuming a bunch of people in their PJs. Uh, thanks so much for coming out at 11 on a Saturday morning to this Scotlit Fest event. The event is part of the Saltire Society's 80th birthday celebrations, so that's sort of what, how it's been put together. Um, I'm Sasha de Boyle uh, from Book Week Scotland, and I'm really delighted to be here this morning talking with two of Scotland's brightest new voices in short fiction, Kirsty Logan and Helen McClory. Um, Kirsty's a short story writer and novelist with three books under her belt. She has a style. I know. <laughs> <laughs> wait, I can, show, I can show you them. Ah, <laughs> wait. Okay, wait, I'll read and you can okay. play. Her okay. debut collection, The Rental Heart and Other Fairy Tales, won the Scott Prize for Literature and was published in 2014. Her first novel, The Grace Keepers, followed soon after <laughs> with Harville Secker, and her most recent book of short stories is a collection of tales and fables called A Portable Shelter, which is out now. And we'll be talking about that a bit today. Yeah. Let me give this to you so you can do the same if you so wish. <laughs> Not so many. <laughs> um, Helen is also a short story writer and novelist and has her first collection out last year on the edges of vision with Queen's Ferry Press. The book uh, beat serious competition to win the Saltire Society's first book award and it is completely deserved. It's a phenomenal piece of work. And her novel, Flesh of the Peach, will follow next year with great books. It's really exciting stuff. So we're going to kick us off with some readings from each of them to give us a flavour of the style of writing and the weird and wonderful worlds that Helen and Kirsty have created. And then we'll have a bit of chat and then we'll open up to questions from you guys. So uh, before we kick off, please uh, join me in giving a massive warm welcome to Kirsty and Helen. Go yes, uh, I'm going to read Coral Red. Um, the stories are quite short. Uh, this should take about three minutes, just in case anyone, you know, starts dozing <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> They'll finish soon. Okay. Miriam's house has featured in several stylish magazines, both print and online, and it tickles her to know that across the globe, photos of the interior are being shared on social media websites, accruing hearts, comments, raised thumbs. Right now, though, the house is haunted. The children gather at playtime, after meals, before bed, and walk together between the walls. Sometimes they bicker, sometimes they sing fragments of song, new songs only out just the year before, and which some of the younger ghosts must have taught the rest. Because some of them are new, they are capable of bruising the walls with the grease of their pink palms. Miriam sighs and asks the cleaner to keep an eye out for the products that will shift the stains without harming the finish on the paint. Miriam is in the sunroom cutting flowers, an opulent arrangement sent by a client or an admirer. South African plant, she thinks, raising one stem, though in fact that is only a guess. She doesn't care to check. The children are walking up and down the stairs. Up and down, and what kind of game could that be other than one to get on her nerves specifically? She had always wanted children, and it is in part her fault that they are here. She pushes a blue thistle beside the gloss of eucalyptus. Another photographer is coming round shortly. There is a smell of coffee brewing. Very fine coffee, not that Miriam can tell. She puts down the scissors and looks through a pane of glass to the garden, to where the rain is falling steadily on the marble fountain and the overgrowth of bushes. There is no diversity of colour beyond green and white, and this is how she likes it very well. Indoors, the predominance is towards neutrals, accent colours where necessary, except in her bathroom. This has been redone recently, with a living wall, so that when she showers, she can lean into mosses and ferns, seeking what she cannot articulate clearly, but which they so readily lend. Her blood is sweet, mosquitoes love her, so Miriam is careful to keep the, keep the screens maintained on the doors and windows. She used to be outside all the time, and now that she has brought the best of the outdoors in, she has no need to battle with the worst. In fact, she rarely leaves the house. In fact, she never leaves unless compelled. There is something terribly wrong with Miriam, and there has been for a long time. But she has no friends to gently tell her this, and the housekeeper Ophelia doesn't see that it's any business of hers. 
and in any case has not troubled herself to peer into the wrongness, to push her head into the depths, where she would be crossing the boundary she has drawn between herself and her employer. Things must be maintained, or structure, blood, selves, lost. It's raining a fine mist in the upstairs bathroom when the photographer goes in. He doesn't seem to notice, nor when he is admiring the sleigh bed and the Amish quilt in the guest room, hearing the voices calling, playfully this time. Here the visual notes are lavender, mint, as if for the digestive soothing of visitors, visitors she no longer expects or has cause to invite. Miriam used to be so wild in her youth. She just hadn't realised it had been her youth, that at 30, 40, she had been no older than a girl. Good friends, home-cooked meals, nights on the dock, swimming under the moon, hangovers spent watching the food channel, drowning that little boy, deep-cutting the other and calling it accidental. How many accidents there were in those days. The photographer wants to see the wine cellar. It's been extensively improved since I inherited the place, Miriam says, putting her hand on the small of his back, her jaw aching, her tiny feet in coral satin house shoes, as they both descend the stair. Thank you. Oh, right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> enjoying being told the story there. Oh, oh good this. story, yeah. <laughs> I'll really read this one. Um, so I'm going to read you, if you're eating breakfast right now, stop. Because <laughs> this will put you off your breakfast. I feel like that's a good, that's a good piece of advice for you guys' story. <laughs> yeah. Like, maybe not with food. They don't, they don't go with yeah. food, generally. Um, so this is a story that I wrote um, when I was casting around for ideas when I was working on this book um, I found this old note that I had written to myself because I tend to just like write notes on bits of paper and then put them in my big story drawer which is literally a, just a drawer with loads of bits of paper in it which I then dig through it's like my little treasure chest when I want ideas for something and I found this note that I had written that said bluebeard in a caravan <laughs> um, I don't know what I meant at the time, but I thought I can do something with that. Um, if you don't know the fairy tale of Bluebeard, the short version is that it's about a woman who marries this mysterious older man and he takes her to his castle and she finds the bodies of all his previous wives who he has killed. It's really cheerful. <laughs> Why people say things like a fairy tale marriage will never make sense to me because that is a fairy tale marriage. <laughs> Um, which presumably is not what people want. Um, although, who knows what straight people want? Um, <laughs> <laughs> presumably not that. Um, so this story is called The Keep, and it is a uh, bluebird in a caravan. In Stop Eating Breakfast also. We started with a ring. We thought she would like that. When she opened the drawer and saw the ring there, reclining gleamingly on a hank of pink silk, her face opened up sunny joyful. We knew that she thought it was from him. That couldn't be helped. She put it straight onto her finger. We watched her toy cattish with it for the rest of the day, twisting it to and fro as she swooned and hummed around the caravan. When she'd first arrived, she'd moved sly foot, placing teacups down with fretting care, each step tight roping. We knew why. When we'd first arrived, we'd seen the way the little tin caravan sat high in the tree, bound to the thick oak branches, hung flimsy-like over a fast-flowing burn. We'd all moved Slyfoot then too, at first. We had not wanted to make the caravan fall clatter-crash out of the tree. But soon we settled, just as she was settled, and her steps fell hard as hail. That was when we crept out of our hiding places. To and fro, to and fro, she twisted the ring. She cleaned in time with her songs, finding pretty nooks for all the things that needed tidied away. A pint of milk, a pink slinking nightgown, a dustpan, a pair of toothbrushes. The caravan was a labyrinth of hidings, drawers and cupboards and little sneaky nooks. 
Finally, she felt the words spark scratchy on her skin. She frowned, pulling off the ring to peer at its innards. Until I die. She rubbed where the etched words had caught her. If we had had breath, we would have held it. We watched her frown a realisation, then release it in fear of wrinkles. We knew as well as she did that he would not stand for wrinkles. Perhaps the ring was not a gift from him after all. Perhaps she'd stumbled on the remnants of old loves. But whose? Until I die. And he was still alive. She tried to open the drawer and hide the ring. But that drawer would not open again today. She tugged and she coaxed, but the drawer stuck fast. Finally, she hid the ring in her face cream, dropping it in and shaking the pot until it was submerged. We watched as she opened and opened and opened the bathroom cupboards until she found one the perfect size, its edges kissing the face cream pot as she slid it in. Such tininess in the caravan, but always somewhere to be secret. When he came home, she greeted him with neat kisses. We hid in the smallest cupboard and listened. There was no talk of gifts. Her finger was swollen where the words had scratched, but he did not notice. Outside the caravan, the rain shushed and the wind throbbed and the moon blinked bright. Inside, time stopped. The chattering burns stole all sound. The spreading leaves took all sight. After dinner, he used his petty magic to transform the couch into their bed. They lay together. We wished that we still had hands so that we could cover our ears. <clears throat> the next day after he had left, we tried again. A hair ribbon, plush velvet, thick as wolf fur, red as a heart. She found it while trying drawers in search of washing up gloves. She forgot about the dishes and reached for the ribbon. It curled lovingly into her hand, and with a turn she bumped the drawer shut with her hip. She pulled back her conker shining curls with one hand, the other ribbon busy. But, a tickle on her finger sides. She stopped and peered, three hairs twist tangled in the ribbon, ever so long and ever so blonde. We watched her look at the hairs. We watched her stroke the blood red ribbon. We watched her fingers come away wet. With a cry, she dropped the ribbon and kicked it away from her. She didn't try to open the drawer again this time. She knotted and knotted and knotted the ribbon and she opened her underwear drawer and pushed it right to the corner, covering it up with her fripperies and frills. When he came home, they ate in silence. Her fingertips were stained red. They went to bed and we had no need of covering our ears. In the darkness, we heard the click-clack of her thoughts. We watched her open the drawer four more times in four more days. We left her a silken negligee, delicate as moth wings, a pair of stockings, twisted garrote thin, eyelashes faded grey and crumbling, painted fingernails with fleshly scraps caught at their bases. And on the seventh day, we left her a heart. We watched her open the drawer as though she were looking into a lion's mouth. She turned Slyfoot again. Despite the labyrinth thing, she was running out of places to hide our things. She pulled back when she saw the heart, enthroned in the drawer among a scatter of dried roses. It shivered in a single beat. She leaned in. Perhaps she thought it was a kitten. Butter soft and full of mules. Perhaps all these gifts were from him after all. We watched her lift out the heart. She held it in her hands. She squeezed it, hard. The flesh bulged around her fingers. Of course she did not think it was a kitten. Now we understood her thoughts and her insides as if her skin were made of glass. He'd taken a caravan, a portable shelter, ordinary as dirt. He'd taken it and magicked it into a labyrinth for girls, a make-believe home the size of eight coffins lashed together. Some girls escaped, but we didn't. We ignored the signs, or the signs weren't there. We'd got lost, and we'd never been found. Our tangles of hair, our bright scraps of frock, tossed up into the trees, 
to be worked into birds' nests. Our straight white bones and our tender mauve organs drop down into the burn, carried out to sea. He thought that was the end of us. She spoke to us then. She told how he had found her, rescued her, claimed her, made her see that the world was cold and dark and hard and empty, but with him, life would be delicious, abundant. He would put his hands over her eyes, and when he took them away, she saw differently. The happenings before him were too hard to focus on, furled and dark like sun-damaged film. All she could see was his face. We know, we cried, though she couldn't hear us. We all knew his face. It was the last thing we'd seen. We shouted that it would be the last thing she'd see too. He'd tear out her heart just so he could hold it in his hands. He'd throw the remnants of her to the trees and the sea. Some of them ran long before reaching the heart. Some of them ignored its urgent throb, staying until they couldn't leave. But for her, this was enough. She dropped the heart. With her bloodied hands, she tore open the door. She ran away. We knew she wouldn't be back. We slipped into the littlest cupboards and waited for him to come back to his crowded, empty home. Thank you. Cheerful for a Saturday morning. <laughs> <laughs> I think, of course, she didn't think it was a kitten, is probably my favorite <laughs> line in that whole story. So grim. Um, so those were really great stories to start us off, because um, one of the things that both of you have cited is that um, you think that Angela Carter is a strong influence on your work. And clearly, um, a commonality of your work is that sort of line between fantasy and reality. And I wondered, what, what sort of drew you to that boundary line as a place to, to inhabit your writing? Yeah, you've got a good question. Mm. <laughs> I'll need to think. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'll just say what comes into my head. Um, I think that the idea of what is real is an interesting one because we have a set of conventions of what is real with literature. But why do we have those? I mean, you can say this is real, a piece of realist fiction, but nothing is real about fiction ever. So the idea of approaching a story on the boundary line isn't maybe what I would say. I'd say there really isn't a boundary line. You can do whatever you want. You can write whatever you want. And being more drawn towards constructing a sort of imaginary, not exactly, you know, your everyday thing isn't necessarily unreal either. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that kind of, I don't know. That notion that if you grow up reading fairy tales and strange stories, you, you can never really look out at the world and think, this is very plain. Mm -hmm. The world is very weird, as we all know from this past couple of days. Very strange things and unexpected, unpleasant things can happen all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and to have fiction that inhabits that idea, or even the idea that there are ghosts or that there are, like the, the world is, is not as it seems isn't that a realist idea as well? <laughs> Not that I'm saying ghosts exist, they sound like maybe someone from the X-Files <laughs> want to believe. But um, it's just, these stories are there in the world, these stories of ghosts, these stories of, of places that have fairies attached to them. In, mm -hmm. You know, in Scotland it's quite common to come across, you know, a, a loch that had a monster in it for yeah. many a long time, and the, even the the idea of that is a real idea. Mm -hmm. Not that it's necessarily true. I'm kind of waffling now, but that's it. <laughs> Nothing is real. <laughs> Nothing's real, and everything's yeah. real, and everything's yeah. real. Getting deep, really. Yeah, mm. I completely agree. This whole concept of a true story is mm -hmm. a false idea to me. Like, what's a true story? Mm -hmm. I think we've all been in that situation where a couple breaks up and you hear the two sides. Like, mm -hmm. which is the true side? both are true but neither are true mm -hmm. there's no objective truth to a situation in mm -hmm. my opinion um i mean there's there's an out and out lie but um i'm not saying we should all go around lying and saying but this is my truth like mm -hmm. sometimes it's just a lie but in terms of how we process things that happen mm -hmm. to us there's no objective truth of an emotional situation yeah. it's just different people's interpretations of it um I think a lot of it was how I grew up. I wasn't really raised in any religion, but there was lots of religion floating around. Like my uncle's a Buddhist, 
Um, Mm -hmm. And my dad, although he wasn't a practicing Christian, did believe in God. So I had all these books, like I had a book of Bible stories. My uncle gave me these Buddhist stories. I was really into Egyptian gods, as I think Mm. all kids go through that phase. Um, I'm kind of still in that phase, to be honest. Um, And fairy tales, obviously I had a lot of fairy tales. And then my granny would tell me old Scottish folk tales and nursery rhymes and things. So I had all these stories floating around. And it wasn't until I was quite old that the concept occurred to me because these were all books. They were all books full of exciting stories. And at some point I picked up the Bible stories and was like, but some people think these ones are real, but not these ones. Why? <laughs> like, why is the Lot's wife turning to salt real mm-hmm. and Bluebeard with his dead wives and the key with the blood in it? Why is that not real then? Mm-hmm. Because to me, they were equally fantastic, brilliant stories, but didn't hold a truth in the traditional sense Mm -hmm. um so I think I just always got in the habit of thinking stories are just amazing and there's not it's not really the case that some are true stories and some are Mm -hmm. made up stories because they will have some kind of truth yeah that's a lovely thought um something I enjoyed about uh, a portable shelter is specifically you know it does really draw heavily on that fairy tale tradition but very much fables and sort of morality stories and I wondered how it felt, you know, being a lover of fairy tales, to approach that and get to get to write your own morals to the mm. story and like invent new ones and be like, well, I decided this is the lesson you're going to learn today. Was it? Like- yeah, no, it was, and like that's that's the Angela Carter thing, isn't it? Like, because mm-hmm. I always loved fairy tales, and then when I was a teenager, I kind of went away from them because they did, mm-hmm. to my mind at the time, have this very simplistic morality of like. And it didn't help that the fairy tale book I had, which I should have brought, all the illustrations, all the women were very thin, had long curly blonde hair, which I will never in a million years look like that. Um, And it just seemed so distant. I was like, that's what I'm supposed to be, like this tiny little waist and the blonde hair, like it's never going to happen. And then the princes were like these buff. They also had curly hair. The illustrator of that book was really into curly hair. <laughs> or I think we must have just learned to do the curls or something. Um, and they, so they just didn't seem to have any relevance to me anymore. Um, and then, you know, I discovered people like Angela Carter or um, Anne Sexton or Emma Donoghue has got an amazing book of retold fairy tales. And they had retold them and reclaimed them with this feminist sensibility Mm -hmm. and it showed me that actually there is still a lot of truth in them and that you don't have to accept a problematic story these fairy tales belong to us all folk tales all these old stories they belong to everybody and we can do whatever we want with them no one's going to come after you for copyright of snow white if you want to retell snow white any way you choose Mm -hmm. um and that was just really mind-boggling to me that like oh I can do what I want with these stories and I don't have to go well I kind of like that but I don't really like this bit I can take Mm -hmm. it and tell it without the bit that I find troubling or that I find backwards thinking or offensive I can tweak it and change it and cast new light on it um so I've got a question for both of you now as um you know you've both had short story collections out and published one of the one of the sort of stances from publishing is that short stories don't sell but you've both had work published and it's done quite well so so what do you think about that what do you think mm, maybe it's a sort of defensive thing to say that they don't mm-hmm. sell and then so they don't have to publish it or they don't have to think about it but mm-hmm. th- th- i mean it's clear that people are reading stories and i think the internet has led to a big resurgence of it so that stories can be published online it's really hard to read a novel online i don't know if you've tried <laughs> <laughs> sitting on the gutenberg one and read it all the way through um so short stories are perfect for that kind of attention that that the internet allows you to pay but with its format um and that if you're you know out and about reading, which I think a lot of people read on commutes um, mm-hmm. in the, f- the sort of fragments of time that they have. Time has fragmented in, in the kind of, uh, you know, the spaces between reading a hot take on the internet or tweeting something or being at work. So you can find this time for a short story that you can't necessarily find for a novel. That doesn't mean, you know, reading a novel isn't something people can do anymore. They have to maybe approach it with a bit more firmness of purpose mm-hmm. this short story just kind of slides in there and it says read me inhabit this space for just as long as you need to inhabit it and then goes and then you kind of you can walk out after that 
carrying it around with you in a different way to mm-hmm. the way you carry around the narrative of a novel. Um, so I think it's, it's for me, I'm very optimistic that short stories and flash fiction too, so even shorter pieces, will have a place and continue to come out. It depends on the stories. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. there's this idea that the traditional short story is a very literary, very small, mm-hmm. very quiet, doesn't really have what people call a proper ending. I don't really understand yeah. what that means, but people say that. <laughs> and I think that's not really the case. Like, it changed for me. I read um, Annie Prue's book that has the story that the film Brokeback Mountain was based mm-hmm. on, and that is an epic story. That has got the breadth and um, emotional intensity of a novel, but it's in the space of a short story. And I think mm-hmm. your book does this, and I, what I hope I can do with my stories mm-hmm. is to give the size of a novel, but in... A short story so mm-hmm. you still have you still feel like you've mm-hmm. inhabited this world of a novel and got to know these characters of a novel but in a very short space so it kind of depends on the short stories I mean I will say from having published two story collections and one novel the novel sells a lot better like I have <laughs> sold significantly more copies of the novel mm-hmm. than the short stories however it it seems to me people love the short stories more yeah. like I get a lot more emails from people who have read the short stories and loved them I, I do get some about the novel but mostly it's the stories so like even though you know novel sales are here and story sales are here the fan base <laughs> kind of levels out interestingly so I don't know if it's just the type of people who would buy the stories or the way that we read them I couldn't say but it is different but I'll, I'll always write both because I love them yeah. Is it perhaps a thing where we have to approach it as marketing or as encouraging yeah. people mm. to read short stories so that they can have that for themselves, that there's maybe a little bit of a barrier to the idea that short stories are worth reading? Isn't that yeah. terrible? Um, but people say, well, it's a novel, it's long, it's engaging. Uh, it's an endeavour, it's my homework. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm going to do it now. Whereas with a short story, they're like, well, you know, they're thinking, why? Why should I read it? So, yeah. you know, that is the kind of thing. And, and people sometimes say, particularly for flash fiction, it's too short, Yeah, which is um, kind of frustrating as a flash fiction writer. It's like you wouldn't read a poem and go, that's too short, mm-hmm. unless it was a haiku. And then you'd probably say, well, that's the, <laughs> that's the convention of a haiku, is it's to be short. There isn't, you know anything that's too short in terms of a short story it's about how you settle yourself into that space and Mm -hmm. inhabit it and and maybe we need to sort of i don't know pamphlet the cities shall we drop some pamphlets (laughs) (laughs) here's how to read a short story and enjoy it (laughs) is that really patronizing it's good for impatient people like i'm super Mm. impatient and i read a lot of children's books and young adult books um because sometimes I just, I want a story and I want it now. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I love novels. I read a lot of novels, big novels as well. But sometimes I've got half an hour and I want someone to tell me a story. Mm-hmm. And that's why I read a lot of children's books. But see if adult books could have that kind of intensity and level of story, but in a really short space. I would read that. Like, I also read, there's a series of books that are actually meant for um, people who have dyslexia or struggle with reading. So they have, like I said, the kind of size and the emotional depth of a novel, but they're incredibly short. You know, you you can read them in 20 minutes. And I love them. Mm -hmm. I must have read about 50 of them because I just want, I want a story (laughs) and I want it now. And I I want it to have intensity and depth and size, but in in a short space. Yeah, sometimes I find myself thinking the opposite. Like I pick up a novella in the bookshop and this is terrible and I go, but it's really short. But I <laughs> love novellas and I've always really mm-hmm. found myself drawn to really great novellas and you're reading it and you're, and then it's finished and you never feel like, where's the rest of the book? Mm-hmm. Whereas with a big novel, sometimes you think there is too much book here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. like, like I gave up shorter. a while ago on Stephen King and I still love his books, but 
God, he waffles. <laughs> really? It's like someone could just edit. Yeah, you yeah. could have like every tenth page. <laughs> that's what you would need. Because yeah. I'm like, you're trying to tell us a story here. And it's not mm-hmm. even like mm-hmm. some books, they're not necessarily plot dense. Like, I don't really think I write mega plotty stuff. Like, lots happens, but it's not like a Dan Brown action thriller. <laughs> um, someday, <Sorry>. maybe. <laughs> um, but some books, not a lot happens, but they're really beautiful and you're really engrossed in them and you don't want to skim them mm-hmm. because the prose is wonderful or the atmosphere is wonderful. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, I just, I just want stories, basically. Mm-hmm. All the time, more stories, always. I think there might be, a like, a sort of assumption that flash fiction is something that people do as almost like a writing exercise to develop mm. an idea and I have to say that your book really sold me on the merits of flash as a as a concept because yeah you can really capture you know the kernel of an idea and and explore it just in a very short space of time mm. um what what started you off writing flash fiction like how did you get started in that genre well I was the same as you I kind of thought how much can you tell in a really mm-hmm. short space is it really worthwhile? Is it just going to be the bones of a story? Mm-hmm. And then I read um, Mother Ghost by an author called Casey Hannon. Um, okay. He's an American author and his book is basically about uh, his experiences as a gay man coming out um, and he has to come out frequently to everyone he knows. So it's sort of over and over again. It's That's what links it, is this idea of being who he is in a, he grew up in the South in the US, so mm. it's quite difficult. And so it has a, a kind of gothic sensibility in a tiny space of the story being retold in different ways. Mm. So you get the sort of um, motifs that come up, you, you, lots of snakes and lots of uh, taxidermied animals mm. and American porches and uh, smoking cigarettes with his mum. Um, and being a ghost and it's just the wonderful it just opened my mind to this idea that you can use use a whole collection of flash fiction or even a single one of his that just intensifies this idea that he is carrying and living Mm. Um, and then I found that there were other authors doing that and I I would find stories in lots of online journals which is where it sort of proliferates Mm -hmm. and I realized that yeah this is something that I really want to be doing and there's a, a breadth of different styles you can employ in such a small space um, and yeah basically that inspired me to write my collection and actually I got him to to provide a little quote on the back because <laughs> I, actually I just wrote him like loads of fan letters being like yeah, you're amazing you're really good um, which is quite sad but you know I actually think um, as an activity that's a really nice thing to do to to go out and write an author, write to an author and say like you inspire me. Um, um, and now I think that because of that idea, that model I had, I could sort of say, right, you can follow a single idea across a whole collection. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a good way to approach it for flash fiction collections. Although I've also seen, and this is really interesting, anthologies of flash fiction where they take stories from all over the world Mm -hmm. and bring them together. This is sort of international anthology of flash fiction. I think it's by Norton, out by Norton. Um, And then they have little essays from the authors themselves, a little bit about what they were doing with that space. Um, So it's just a a whole load of possibilities. It's like all these little postcards out in the world. You've got Mm -hmm. this little square, this little blank square, but there's so much you can do with it. You can complain about the weather. (laughs) You can tell them about some haunted graveyard you found when you're off on your travels. Uh, You can write a list. It's, It's really endless. And I love that sense of possibility rooted in language and repeated themes because I think we all carry these um, touchstones in our lives things that we think about you know if you if you live in Edinburgh probably always at the back of your mind is the castle so that could be Mm -hmm. something that comes through or maybe you are a person who loves snakes or writing about snakes and so you can kind of draw them in again or uh, the act of doing something quite meticulous or difficult Mm -hmm. perhaps knitting um, and that draws in in this tiny world as well that's what I love about it. I just love it. <laughs> and readers are smart. Like, I mm-hmm. think you don't need to explain everything to yeah. the reader. Like, we get it. You can you can 
get so much across in so few words. You don't have to be Stephen King and it, yeah. uh, explain everything. Like we can pick stuff up mm -hmm. in from very few little hints. And some writers need to trust readers. Yeah, and sometimes they pick up totally a thing that you didn't intend, but that's also really good too because they can kind of build their own little world, mm -hmm. worlds from these words that you've given them. And that's a, I think that creative act is really good too. And that's it's a, yeah about trusting the reader. Yeah, and it's not like there's right and wrong. Like I sometimes get emails, especially if people are studying. Somebody somewhere is using <laughs> the rental heart to teach English as a foreign language. For, mm. I don't know who or where, but I get so many emails from people who are learning English and they want to know if they are correct in their interpretation of the story. And I'm always like, if you think that, then yeah, it's correct. doesn't matter what I mean. Mm -hmm. Like any reader's interpretation is correct. It's not like a story is a puzzle to be solved. It, it means whatever you want it to mean. And I get reviews that say, well, Logan clearly meant this. And I think that never occurred to me in a million years. But you, I, like, I'm happy with that interpretation, but it wasn't what I meant. I don't think it's wrong, but mm. I, I just, yeah, think, trust the reader. Whatever the reader thinks is completely valid. Although sometimes you think that's an ungenerous interpretation. Oh, yeah. And you're like, mm. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but it is for you. But you what know. can you do? Yeah, what can you do? <laughs> what yeah. can you do? We're like, the, the author is dead, so we're just kind of like haunting, yeah. haunting the text. Yeah, like <laughs> once you put stuff out there, it's not yeah. yours anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that an ungenerous interpretation probably just comes from an ungenerous mind. Mm. Um, with your writing, obviously, you have had short story collections and a novel out and you have a novel forthcoming next year. What's it like to switch between the two? Is it nice to write a novel after writing a bunch of stories? Do you, you know, long for one form or the other? Yeah, I think um, they're the two parts of my story brain in terms mm. of reading and writing. So, you know, I love these little, like, punches of story that are these little kids' stories or flash fictions that are just these like really intense bits of story but I also love getting really stuck into a big huge novel one of my favorite books is uh, The Crimson Petal and the White by Michelle mm -hmm. Faber which I must have read about six or seven times and my copy is a proof and it's enormous it's like 900 pages anyway but my copies like I can't even fit it in any bag that I own <laughs> so I have to literally carry it in my hands if I'm reading it um but I don't mind. <laughs> I love it. And I love that it's so hefty and kind of rambling and beautiful and has this epic scope. Sometimes you want that and sometimes mm -hmm. you want just a little perfect gem of a story. So for me with writing, sometimes I'm in that mood, like I've just finished a novel draft, which has mm -hmm. taken me a year, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it, this is my only job. So <laughs> it's been a really dense year. Um, and I was just, I'm so sick of it. I'm sick of everything about to do with it. And like, I need to start workshopping it and editing it now. And I'm like, oh God, I hate this book so much. Um, it, it's good. <laughs> um, I'm just, I've spent a lot of time on it. You won't spend a year on it. So you won't feel the same as me. Um, and now I'm about to start a short story collection and I am so ready. I'm just so ready. I'm, it's all going to be horror stories, like literary horror stories. So kind of like the keep, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I, I just can't wait to just experiment with form a bit more and try loads and loads of different ideas try stuff that doesn't work as a novel because yeah. a story is what it is and if a story works as a short story it's not going to work as a novel and I'm just really excited to explore these ideas that I've been having over the past year that I had to keep thinking oh it's not going to work for the novel I'll just save that is it so, okay is it okay to put them aside like can you do that when you're writing a novel or are you just like oh, no, yeah you write, them, you write them on a scrap of paper and put them in the story chest like yeah. blue bid in a caravan and then you find them a year later and go don't know what i meant but <laughs> okay <laughs> let's go with that yeah, yeah. For me, it's a bit different because and I've had this sort of uh, feedback on my longer writing that I write things like I'm writing a short story mm -hmm. or a, even a flash fiction. So um, the, the structure of the novel that's going to come out next year is really, really small chapters. So there's about 102 chapters, but the book is only 56,000 words long. Um, so I'm hoping it gives people a sense of achievement rather than <laughs> just like, why is it? Why is there a chapter every 500 words? Um, so that I'm just <laughs> kind of, you know, the, the idea of the, the, the freedom with the short story is the same. So that when you're working on something longer, you, it does become like, this is, this is an epic journey, but maybe I want to take a little sidestep mm -hmm. into a world. And while I, I actually tend to write shorter pieces while I'm working on something longer as a mm -hmm. form of relief, because it's just... <laughs> 
You're like, I did a break. I completed <laughs> something. I finished something. It's <laughs> there. It exists while well, this thing carries on forever. Because it always takes me forever to write and rewrite things. Mm-hmm. I think the book coming out, I finished that formally in about 2012. Wow. After about, I don't know, six drafts all the way through. And just now I'm doing the edits. I think I, I went through the editor's edits and then I decided to go through it again myself and mm-hmm. it's just that constant like cycling through this landscape of a book that even though it has that in- well it does have that intensity of language which leads to kind of exhaustion um, and hopefully not for the reader <laughs> it doesn't do that um, but I think yeah with that se- with that sense of mind where you cannot get immersed completely and I wish I had that because that ability to be epic is something I really relish. Like, I love The Crimson Petal and The White mm-hmm. as well. There's not a point where you go, this is too long. This is just, you know, going on and on. It's not, it's it's following its own epic pace. Um, and how does he do that? Because not even that much happens. But it's know. just so engrossing, like every word. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful sort of balance of style and, and pacing as well. Uh, yeah, no, me, I'm just like little fragments and shards and uncomfortable bits and a hundred million chapters. <laughs> <laughs> no, that sounds pretty good. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the book is about? Are we allowed to know? Yeah, it's called uh, Flesh of the Peach and it's a novel of grief and rage, which sounds really dramatic, and art and being bad at art when that's your passion and failing to be an immigrant uh, in the US. Um, so part of it was uh, inspired by the time I spent in America. I lived there for about a year and a half and found it extremely difficult. It's very difficult to be American, I, f- I feel. <laughs> and that's, it's, that, it's not a criticism of America. It, it's just the idea of being an immigrant is, is hard. You have your own stories with you and then you're coming up against this vast narrative of America or whatever country you're in. And it's sort of, it's a battle. Mm-hmm. And then amid this kind of, yeah, this this experience or the everyday realities of trying to understand this culture that you've moved to, you know, how to shop, and which is, sounds really basic. So you go into a shop in America, a big supermarket, and there's half an aisle devoted to apple puree. <laughs> and How do you, you even do with that? They eat it as a for snack. Babies. Oh, no, no, no for kids. Weird. Okay. Yeah, and you're, and you're just like, do I need apple puree in my life now? <laughs> I don't know. And you sort of like, I remember the first time I was in an American supermarket properly took me about an hour just wandering around being confused about what I needed and, and then going to the checkout and going like, I have way too many things and I'm not having enough money for all of these things. And I speak English and they speak English, but the, the absolute gulf in the culture is is intense. So I wanted to write a narrative that was about going to America with preconceived notions you go with to a place like America um, and having a sense of, of loss that is tied. So the character, uh, the main character, it follows her very closely through the stages of kind of uh, living in America and grieving the loss of a a pretty toxic relationship and the loss of her estranged mother, who was a very successful English artist of the sentimental James Kincaid variety. I don't know if you've ever seen his paintings. They are dreadful. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so judgy, but they they sell a lot. Uh, It's pictures of like little cottages with like a shaft of of sunlight and um, (laughs) and buttercups and, uh, you know, lots of... I don't know, uh, wintry scenes mm-hmm. where it's all like cute and fluffy and um, uh, never in the 20th century or the 21st century. Mm-hmm. Just everything is is very 19th century and pretty. Um, anyway, so her, her mother is this, this artist who's incredibly successful and she's had a conflict with her and she wants to be an artist in her own right and do weird things that are, are a bit twisted and dark mm-hmm. but meaningful to her. Um, so she's been separated from from her mother and she keeps and her mother has died and she keeps thinking back on that relationship and the idea of living in England because she's English and, and Englishness versus the experience of being in America. And she moves between New York and New Mexico, which is a part of America I I had no idea about before I visited is it's called the land of enchantment. That's their mm-hmm. that's their marketing yeah. slogan. But it really is. It's such a magical place, and it's full of um, 
like Native American towns that were never conquered. Um, these sort of adobe uh, towns in the middle of the desert and ruins. And there's a town that was the first capital of the New World right in the middle of New Mexico. Mm-hmm. And now it's just a junction of streets and fast food restaurants. Uh, it's really a bizarre place. So it's, it's her exploring that idea of, you know, Americanness, contrasting even New York, America with mm-hmm. this Southwest area. Uh, the, as you can tell, it's probably not very plot based as well. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of um, instances of violence and uh, regret. Um, so hopefully that intensity is there in these tiny little chapters. And it's a bit experimental too, because I, I don't know how to write a straight sentence. I don't really know how not to be. <laughs> I can't wait to read it. I love it. It's about making bad art. That's my new obsession. Ooh. Yeah. So I just have you guys seen the film The Room? Mm. Yes. It's so bad. But like gloriously bad. Mm-hmm. Like you couldn't try and make something that bad <laughs> with all the skills. <laughs> like it's it, it's jaw droppingly bad. But I also read this book called The Disaster Artist, which is about you guys read this is so good. Um which is by the main actor that's in the film about how the film was made. Because it was the guy the same guy wrote it, directed it, produced it, starred in it, and probably everything else, probably did the lighting as well. Yeah, yeah. And he's just, he's a fascinating and bonkers man. And um, yeah, it's, it's just so interesting. And I just, I'm so obsessed with, because the, the argument of the disaster artist is that he did intend to make like this great American epic and it just went so badly wrong. And now he says, oh no, it was a comedy all along. But I'm like, but was it? And I'm really obsessed <laughs> yeah. with this. Like, where did it go wrong? At what point did could it have been good or not? Or I'm just really fascinated by the creation of bad art. There's a documentary yeah. about the film, the terrible film, The Island of Dr. Moreau, the Val Kilmer one, which is fascinating. <laughs> like, don't watch the film because it's really bad. Um, <laughs> but the documentary about the making of the film, I'm just fascinated by it. And there's another one, this is my obsession, as you can tell. There's a film called The Boondock Saints, which is also really mm. bad. But there's a documentary called Overnight about the making of Boondock Saints, which is far more interesting. And that. again, <laughs> it's just like, how does this bad art get made? At what point does it go wrong? Mm-hmm. Because they always start out like they could be okay, and then somehow it just gets more and more wrong. And I'm just I'm obsessed with that. It's like, so I can't wait to read this. Watching a, a diplomatic incident unfold, you're like, how, yeah. did, how did war break out? Yeah, at what point <laughs> could it have been saved? It's interesting you mentioned the film The Room, because actually in the I'm working on a collection of of. Uh, short stories and flash fictions and Tommy Wiseau the guy who stars he's a repeated character (laughs) because I'm obsessed as well he is so interesting you should go and watch an interview with him surely he's not real he's He's, like a time traveller he's a vampire (laughs) yeah he can't be real he's not real so he's an example of the fictionality of real life you're like Look at this character. Yeah. He, he exists in the world. Uh, he is a story walking around. Mm. The danger of watching the room is well, you end up quoting all the terrible. <laughs> my favorite, my all-time favorite um, line of dialogue. Uh, English is not his first language, but he wrote the script, so it's got these kind of weird, slightly off phrases. And at one point, the character, what he means is keep your opinions to yourself, but he says keep your stupid comments in your pocket. <laughs> and I love that. I could never write a line like that. It's so good. I, I actually. I actually lifted one of the lines from the movie, put it in my story, and it's just the bit where he, he goes into the roses, the, the kind of the florists to buy. Oh yes. yeah, <laughs> yeah. And he asks if the dog's real. Yeah, he asks if the dog's real, and he says, uh, like, bye, doggy. Yeah, it's like in this really strange. He's a grown yeah. man. He's like fifty. <laughs> bye, doggy. Bye, doggy. And I put that in the story because I just thought it was so oh, wonderful. The thing I was doing to my wife for a while, which she loved, as I'm sure you can imagine. Every time he walks in the door, he goes, "Hey, babe." <laughs> <laughs> like, come in the front door, hey babe. She didn't think it was funny. <laughs> I'm glad you're why. This, this common ground of obsession. I know, this bad art obsession. Mm-hmm. Yeah, anyway. Who knew, who knew that you know, the strongest literary voices? I know. Obsessed with Fascinated by terrible bad art. movies. So, if anyone has any like good documentaries about how bad art is made, I'm, yeah. I'm so into that. Please let us know. Um, we're going to have some questions from the audience now. So, if anyone has any burning questions they'd like to ask Kirsty or Helen, now is your chance, and if not, I've got like a million questions, so <laughs> you can carry on. Anybody? Go on. I know it's early on a Saturday, but... Okay, I'll go. Yeah! 
Hey, babe, that's my wife. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you were talking about the fact that you were talking earlier about um, the differences in you, you've just written your stories and you now you're going to write a novel or you're currently writing a novel and you have written short story novel, short story and well, you've got a novel that's kind of almost ready um, and you both have different experiences of how those novels and stories mm. have been published um, and obviously we're in Scotland and we're talking about publishing and uh, your story collection Kirsty, is coming out later on in oh, the yeah. year, mm -hmm. the Portable Shelter is coming out later on in the year in a bigger press mm -hmm. and I actually haven't asked you this question. How do you feel? I know, I'm like, oh my god, I haven't asked you this Have you thought of it? Like, uh -huh. um, how do you feel about having something that you have in a, a really small, yeah. nice thing? Um, to now you don't know what that's going to look like. Yeah. And mm -hmm. also your experience of the same thing, Helen. Yeah, like kind of going out of your safe zone. Yeah, safe zone. Yeah, no, I totally get what you mean because um, I, for years before my first book was published, I was doing readings. Um, and had was doing stuff on social media and loads of stuff online, like publishing in online magazines and everything. And I thought I knew what it was like to have a very small audience, but but people reading my work. And then it was so weird when I published, and particularly when I published The Grace Keepers, because my publisher is a, a big publisher in London, and they did like billboards, and it was it was huge, like it was ridiculous. I'd never thought anything like that would happen. And it was really strange because people would tweet me and go, I read your book, and I would think, but I don't know you. How, <laughs> you, how did you find this? As if it wasn't like in a bookshop for anybody to buy. It was really strange to me because for so many years, you basically beg anybody to read <laughs> something that you've written, like, please listen to me. And then suddenly you write the exact same thing, but suddenly people are willing to give you money for it. Like people who don't even know you and aren't friends with your mom. Like, it's amazing. <laughs> so it's strange and scary because suddenly it is like you're out of your comfort zone. And someone described it to me, and I like this, is um, when you're just tweeting and you're like sending tweets to just people that you kind of know, but then someone retweets you. And then suddenly <laughs> thousands of people who don't know you have read your joke, which may not work so well when people don't know you. This hasn't happened to me personally, but that's why I'm very careful what that I tweet. Uh, yeah, that's and then they maybe they don't know you and they don't understand yeah. the context or that maybe you're being sarcastic. And the lovely amount of being like, 43 people have retweeted, what is going on? And it's because someone else. Yeah, and it's, it's quite scary because you think, oh no, I'm not talking to my people anymore. Yeah. Um, and how are they going to take it? And they take it the way that they take it. Like people say what they say, and um, I try and live by RuPaul, who was paraphrasing somebody else, was saying what other people think about you is none of your business. Um, mm. So I try and do that. But yeah, that's a complicated question. Um, it's, it's weird, really weird, to have strangers reading your work. That's interesting. So my experiences are a bit different because I am just very, just starting out, really. So I'm still at the stage where I'm like, you know, my mom, my mom is here, my dad is here. Um, they're they're my readers, <laughs> but I have been read more than that. I've read you. you have read. Mine. <laughs> I've read. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I have a very small audience still, but with the Saltire uh, First Book Award, that changed pretty much everything. It, my expectations were always very, very low for the number of people who would ever read it or buy it. Because this book was published by a wonderful but tiny American press based in Texas. Um, they don't have a big marketing budget. Even getting it, in, I never thought it would be available in the bookshops at all, really, mm -hmm. here. And then I remember um, when the book won, actually just when it was nominated, uh, 
Waterston said, do you have any copies of this book? We're finding it hard to find it. So I walked, this is, this is my like hardship story. I walked with a box of about 40 of them, the, the books I had bought myself to sell when I went, I organized a tour around the States and you know, crowdfunded it and just had that DIY thing. So I'm like, okay, got some of my books. I thought I would keep them in a box forever that nobody would ever buy them. <laughs> kind of like, have you seen um, Inside Lewin Davis? Where every, <laughs> every musician has a box of their own albums that nobody wants. I had that box of books and so I took it down to Waterstones in the rain, walking with my box, going like, I don't know, they probably won't, you know, they don't really want all of these. And they took the box and they sold them all. And they're now, well, they, they at least have them in uh, the Waterstones around. It exists in bookshops and that still thrills me. So sometimes I go and visit it. <laughs> 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 That's really nice. I actually remember when you were nominated um, because the day of the awards, I was working with um, the buyer from Waterstones, Angie, mm. and she was like, we don't have any copies of the book. And she knew that it had won because she gets like advanced details being like, head honcho. I'm not sure if I was supposed to say that. <laughs> um, she was like, I don't know what we're going to do. Like, people are going to want to buy this book. What do we do? We need to get more. So I'm really glad that more copies are out there in the world. Um, as a side note, we don't have book sales on today for people in person, but anyone online who wants to buy these books, if you go to the event page, you can go um, via Amazon, Independence, there's a bunch of different options for buying books online. So go and buy them because they're really good. Oh, except you can't buy this one, oh, really? um, which I should have said. So this book, this is another difference in the publishing, uh, the, way, the weird way that publishing works. So this book was published by a very, very tiny, tiny, tiny Scottish press and they decided to publish it um, as a limited edition of a thousand. Um, because it's so nice, like it's shiny and it's hardback. I love it so much. Um, and I thought, because it had taken me about a year to sell a thousand copies of my first book. So I was like, it'll take a year-ish. And then about 800 were pre-ordered before it was published. And I was like, what the hell? Maybe we shouldn't have done a thousand. Because um, I just thought, I thought like it'll take a while to sell all them. And they sold out so fast. Um, so this, like, I can't even sell this because this is literally the only copy. Like, I own one copy of my own book. <laughs> um, it is going to be reprinted. So um, Vintage, who published The Grace Keepers, will be publishing a paperback in um, October this year. So that will, that's not limited. That's like as many as people want to read, I guess. Um, but yeah, so that was strange also. To, and then I would kind of do readings and I would have these books to sell and I would say, well, here's my first book, here's my second book, here's the third one. Um, I only have these two though, it's sold out and everyone go, I want that one. And I'm like, well, but the others are good too. <laughs> it's like, as soon as you make it limited, yeah. it's like people Helen. people want it. Somewhere. But Helen's book is also very limited. It is very limited. <laughs> very, very <good>. there you <laughs> Yeah, actually, I have an event on. I yeah, can oh, yeah. plug my event. Uh, on the 6th of July at the Voodoo Rooms in Edinburgh at 8 o'clock, um, I've sort of uh, been, I've been contacted by this amazing Canadian pop, art, pop singer. This it sounds very strange, but uh, we met at the Banff Centre in Canada because I got a, a Creative Scotland fellowship there and we met up. She has this wonderful big voice, like Amy Winehouse voice. Um, and uh, sort of slightly experimental but pop song sensibility. She's going to be singing. So I, um, I arranged for her and her cellist slash bandmate, uh, Melissa Bendura, to, to perform. And I'll be reading as well. And there'll be a couple of other people reading. And there'll be like the 10 copies I own <laughs> for sale. Um, and I don't know, yeah, I don't know about availability after that. It is quite like when the publisher runs out, she runs out, I don't know. So come along to that if you if you like. It's five pounds on the door and you get amazing Canadian music <laughs> and me standing on the stage <laughs> being awkward. And then start some sort of movement to get it reprinted. Please do. That would be really nice. Yeah. Yeah, um, is it available as an ebook? It is available on ebook. That's oh, true. That's good. Is that really bad? I don't think ebook book equals yeah, yeah, book. Yeah, no, 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 still like, got it. No, it doesn't count. Because okay. you can't find them. them. You can't. So they, they don't them. feel real. I could, you know, like attach a typed thing to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just my name typed out. Sign everybody's Kindles. Yes. Yeah, like, oh, sorry, you can't read it now. But it looks great. <laughs> um, we've probably got time for one more question. We've only really got one question. Yeah. 
Um, have you ever been haunted by a character or a story or an idea that you've created? That's such a good question. Oh, Thank you. That is a good question. Well, yeah. So the book, the novel that I've just finished is actually the first novel I ever wrote, which I have rewritten from scratch now four times. I've written other novels in the meantime, but I just can't let go of it. I don't know why, but I have said this is the last time. <laughs> if it doesn't work this time, like if I workshop it, I'll show it to my editor and they go, oh, Kirsty, no. Um, <laughs> then, okay. But I say that, I probably won't in 10 years. I'll go, aha, now I know what to make. Because it's like, I've changed it so profoundly each time that I don't even know why I'm saying it's the same book. Cause it's only the same book in my head. Like no one else would really recognize it as the same book. Cause it's like, like that ship where they replace all the different parts. Is it still yeah, the same ship? Yeah, exactly. Really? Yeah, like in my head it's the same, but it's like the title, the setting, the characters are all different. So. <laughs> <laughs> but in my head it's the same book. Um, so yes, I could not, I, I just can't let go of that book and I don't know why. What is it about, about it that haunts you? Do you know? Do you know, I don't even know. What is it? it because I think it, Talks, how can I say this without revealing the terrible truths of my soul? Um, <laughs> because I think it explores the, the thing that I fear I am. Ah, it's going to be good. Yeah, no. <laughs> Honestly, when, you make, when it works, it's going to be amazing. So I hope so. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, there's some, there's some like horrible, dark, writhing secret truth mm -hmm. in it that I hate and. I'm obsessed with, I think. Mm. Isn't that the best book, though? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That makes it better, I think. Mm. Uh, for me, I think I'm in kind of in the same position. It's really odd because the first novel I ever wrote, uh, I wrote for like, um, Glasgow University PhD in creative writing, and it's called Killia, and it's about a character called Killia who uh, has a, a quite a difficult life. Um, so it's again a mix of of this. Yeah, realism. I'm going to just do scare quotes around everything. <laughs> realism, real life, a story, you know. <laughs> you get like earrings that have got quotes in yeah, it's very <laughs> um, So she, she grows up on this island and uh, she's, in, she's being looked after by this, this figure who has manipulative and sinister designs and has told her that, he is her, uh, that she is his daughter when it's not true. Um, and I love manipulative and sinister books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. uh, and also there are um, fairies is the wrong word because I think people get the idea of like little tiny winged yeah. creatures, but it's more like the Scottish folklore yeah. fairies that are big and scary and can take you in, under the mountain. Nice. Yeah, so they are in it as well. Um, and it has not been, it got me my first agent. Um, now I have uh, another agent and she's reading it right now and it has never successfully been accepted anywhere but I still feel like there's value in it mm -hmm. and th I think also I'm attached to the character of Kilia because she's really nice and I very rarely write <laughs> <laughs> nice and true characters I just I'm more yeah. interested in writing people who are just awful and you wouldn't want to hang out with <laughs> but she has a heart of gold and uh, she, I just want her to is that terrible I've invented this person I guess uh, did I say that realism isn't real anyway? So she's, real. she's my child. <laughs> but she's not your child. But she's not my child. <laughs> That's so weird that yours has got fairies in because mine has too. But really? like sexy, dark, murderous. <laughs> mine are oh, ominous. Odd. Yeah. Ominous uh, portents mm. of fairies. I feel like you two have a lot of similar threads within mm. your writing, but that what comes out at the end looks very, very different. And mm. I really enjoyed that reading both books for the event. Like there's one story in a portable shelter that what happens is almost identical to what happens in one of your stories, mm. Ellen. And I was like, this is so weird. They're so different. Yeah, no, it is. I think because we have a lot of similar cultural reference mm -hmm. points, like, mm -hmm. although we didn't know each other, obviously, when we were growing up, I think we probably watched and read and were fascinated by a lot of the same things. Mm -hmm. And there's a sense of place as well, mm -hmm. like, yeah. that Scotland carries all these kind of stories and the sense that there can be, you know, fairies and ghosts mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. werewolves and uh, yeah. all manner of mermaids. Um, yeah. We've probably run out of time, even though I feel like we could talk mm -hmm. all day. Yeah. There's not much to talk about. Cool. Is it really fast? Yeah, do you guys okay. make it I'll do a five word answer. Okay. Okay. It might be a bit difficult to do that. But okay. um, I was just going to ask if your short stories draw on anything, like um, 
like fairy tales and myths with Kirsty or your recurring Tommy Wiseau, <laughs> do you think you have any responsibility to that character or that myth or that previous idea, or do you think it's yours to rip apart as you want to? Yes, no answers only. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I agree mean, too. It's mine. Good two words. Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's an agreement. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a good, good piece of advice to end on. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not saying write copyrighted things. Yeah, don't do that. But I mean, these <laughs> these Although it works for Twilight. Oh uh, yeah. Mm. yeah. But generally, if a story is in culture, it, it belongs to all of us. You can do what you want with it. I think that's such a lovely way to end. Really. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for coming along today and for your questions. Thanks to everyone who is watching or listening at home. So weird. Um, <laughs> still not over it. And uh, remember that if you want to get the books, you can buy them online. Check out the website page. Uh, maybe buy the ebook for Helen's <laughs> book mm-hmm. so that more of them exist in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and come to the event on the 6th of July. Mm-hmm. Yes, please. Do you got any events coming up? We should mention. Uh, <laughs> check your website. I yes. Check my website. Yeah. <laughs> really. Um, this was a really really fun event. Thanks so Thank much. You. Thanks to Scott Litfest for putting it on. So uh, Thank just you. say a big thanks. Do a round of applause.